Wednesday night, and I'm a program manager in continuing education and mass art. Think Thursdays is a monthly series of conversations about current and future practice in disciplines of art and design with CE faculty, alumni, and friends. This evening's discussion is on three-dimensional art, craft, art, and vision. Our moderator is Annie Mayer, a graduate of Nassar's BFA program who works with and teaches for continuing education. Our panelists, Kelly G. Conroy, Paul Veleke, and Peter Thibault all teach at Nassar. I'll give a little background on each person and then turn things over to Annie. I'll start with Paul. Paul Veleke is an artist whose practice combines assemblage, soft sculpture, and steel fabrication with the goal of culturally engaging viewers. He has been program coordinator and assistant instructor for the Beamer Pre-College Program at Brandeis University and co-teaches soft sculpture with Janet Ness for continuing education at Massart. Paul has had residencies at the New York Studio School and the Post Contemporary in Troy, New York. He received his BFA from Brandeis University and his MFA from Massart and he lives and works in Boston. Welcome, Paul. <laughs> Kelly G. Conroy has taught metals and enamel at the Worcester Center for Crafts and jewelry at UMass and for continuing education at MassArt. Her jewelry work focuses on life cycles in nature and her specialties are enameling and working with natural materials, carving bone, piercing mother of pearl, and casting. She is a BFA in art education from Syracuse University and an MFA in jewelry metals from UMass Dartmouth. Welcome, Kelly. <laughs> Peter Thibault is an educator and self-described maker of everything and anything. His work includes furniture design and fabrication, sculpture, assemblage, collage, drawing, graphic design, retail design, exhibit design, interior architecture, wayfinding design, and mural design and painting. He teaches at MassArt and has taught at Rhode Island School of Design, Northeastern University, UMass Dartmouth, Wentworth Institute, and the Elliott School. His work has been shown in numerous museums and galleries nationwide and is included in many institutional, corporate, and private collections. He is a BFA from Rhode Island School of Design and an MFA in Visual Arts from the Art Institute of Boston, which is our College of Art at Bessie University. Welcome, Peter. <laughs> Annie Bear is a Boston-based studio artist with a focus in woodworking. She has taught courses and workshops at various locations, including Massar, the Elliott School of Fine and Applied Arts, the Fuller Craft Museum, and Haystack Mountain School of Crafts and has shown work in galleries and museums in and around Boston, including Aviary Gallery, Dora Gallery, and the Fuller Craft Museum. Her studio practice is based out of Humphrey Street Studios in Dorchester. Annie has a BFA in Industrial Design from Massard, and she is the moderator for tonight. Welcome, Annie. <laughs> Thank you all for being here this evening. Now over to you, Annie. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, and thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, so the overarching question we're presented here uh, is about craft, fine art, and design, and where they differ and where they overlap. Uh, so that's a pretty huge jumping off point. So I figured I'd start by narrowing it down and kind of zeroing in on the line between functional crafts and fine art. Uh, functional crafts uh, often struggle to be accepted into a fine art context. and. I wonder uh, what our panelists here think about the line between the two. Uh, so what is it about a functional object that decides its future and how we determine if it lives in a retail or a gallery setting uh, and what makes a functional object relevant in a fine art context? So any, any one of you can jump off, but there's time for, for everyone to speak. Well, I, um, Mitch uh, Ryerson, who also teaches at uh, emailed me today and said, uh, artists, for wall, uh, artists for people with wall space, crafters with, with, for people with floor space. <laughs> uh, and it, uh, I just think um, that the two have blurred 
constantly uh, grown and uh, been accepted and then drifted away. Um, I think that there's uh, obviously art and craft, and there's also craft and art. So, uh, a lot of hybrids in, the, in, the, in between. Can I speak to jewelry? Um, I know jewelry technically is functional, but it is an excessive. No one needs jewelry. We, need, we do need furniture, ceramic objects to eat and drink out of. Um, however, I think of jewelry as an excess, uh, so I sort of argue about the functionality of jewelry. Um, but that being said, I, jewelry is definitely in the craft field. My MFA was actually artisanry, which is a made-up word, but it was distinctive away from fine art. Um, and my professor often would talk about how we were the lower level people. Uh, he said the fine artists are using their mind, they're closer to God, and us crafts people are with our hands closer to the earth, closer to the devil. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if I agree all with that. Um, but it just, I was always stuck with me, and I think about that a lot, and I don't necessarily identify as a craftsperson. Um, I think I'm an artist working in a craft sphere, field of craft materials, but um, I think jewelry definitely struggles to get accepted into um, the art field in general. We have our specific art jewelry galleries, but we're a very small field, and we're always fighting to get that acceptance. I'd say the one place, um, Schmuck in Germany, is the one place where I think art is fully on accepted jewelry as a art. <coughs> So um, maybe thinking a little bit art historically, I think that kind of the, the distinction between craft and art is in its own way more of a modern distinction, right? And I, um, especially considering like Western art history and thinking about pre-Renaissance art and craft as kind of a more merged, like melded guild system where it was more about adherence to certain you know, standards and kind of post-Renaissance is when my understanding is kind of a more separated kind of creation happened between artisans and artists as celebrity. And I think I'm very excited that, that might be kind of squeezing back together as a separate, as no longer two separate entities. So it might be kind of a cyclical thing that we're coming back to. It all being one thing. And um, I know in certain, certain other cultures, things that we might consider as craft forms were the predominant, predominant form of visual expression. I think it's uh, interesting, but maybe slightly flawed distinction, in my perspective. Uh, yeah, very interesting. A few of you actually already touched on uh, the question I had queued up next, which was sort of about the word craft and how uh, you know we've seen it removed from the names of major institutions and kind of shunned uh, by people who have formerly embraced it. And I often feel like we're in a bit of a craft revival, but Peter pointed out before we got up here that you know maybe it just feels that way because of the communities we uh, hang out in. Um, but as far as that ebb and flow of how we embrace and, and sort of shun craft, uh, do you, what do you think about today? Are we are we in a bit of a, a craft revival, or does it remain a dirty word? I don't think I don't think it's a dirty word. I think. Um, there's so many so many artists out there now, and, and it's, it's sort of weird. Everything is becoming art, you know. I mean, like sociology is art, uh, uh, sexual identity is art, uh, uh, anthropology is art, uh, and uh, grad schools have been um, pulling large groups of, of, of students in and teaching them the same basic. Um, Critical, critical analysis for all the different fields. And, and as a result, I think um, a lot of different people are deciding to take on the name of an artist. Or, and, and I think that become an artist is a little bit more appealing to say I'm going to become a craftsman nowadays. So in that level, I think that the word is a bit of a pejorative today. But it, it's a, it's also everybody is claiming to be an artist. It's like I mean, Kanye West just decided to be an artist, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and I think one legitimate crossover person is maybe um, Lady Gaga, perhaps. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, that, that's, in terms of, right now I don't think, you, I don't think anybody's gonna stand up on a stage and say, I'm a craftsman, it's just not gonna happen. They may have a lot of craft in their work, but they're not, they're gonna say they're an artist first. Um, and depending on what they do, Um, I uh, happen to believe I've seen a lot of craft in the media, and I do believe that we are having a craft revival. Uh, I, I'm blanking on which truck company it was, but there was this commercial maybe a few months back, and it was there was some craftsman's studio getting his hands dirty working on the anvil, you know, hammering something, and then the whole thing was like handcraft in the USA. It was just trying to really romanticize what craft is. And if you sort of see the millennial experience of like handcrafted pickles and handcrafted chocolate, everyone's <laughs> really marketing that as what they're doing. And yes, people are looking to work with their hands in any sort of way, and they're using craft as a really romantic term, and that's what millennials are looking for. They want to connect with objects. Um, they want to know who made their thing, whatever that thing is. Um, so I do think craft is having a revival. I think it's less of a dirty word. Um, We'll see where it keeps going. I think it's kind of a little bit could be overused and there'll be a backlash, of course, as things are, go. Um, but yeah, I happen to agree. I think we're in a revival. And I see that in my classes. I see a lot of people who are tired of technology being on their computer all day and they're in their phones all the time and they want to just do something with their hands and turn off their mind. So I have a lot of people in my CE jewelry class who are coming in to just get away from their desk job and unplug. And they're just so fulfilled by working with their hands. So I'm happy that you know that's where it provides a place for that for people. Um, but yeah, I'm no, definitely noticing in the general public are looking for craft, and so they must be picking up on some of those signals, wherever they may be. So I think the our previous two speakers brought up some really interesting points, and I kind of need to agree with uh, Peter about the ubiquity of the words art and craft in my uh, studying uh, attempts to study for this talk. You know, I, I googled art versus craft, and I just got a huge list of you know, articles, like the art and craft of shark fishing, the art and, cra <laughs> art and craft of um, dating, the art and craft of all these things that really I've never really considered as either art or craft. So I think that's an <laughs> interesting thing how the words are getting kind of used and morphed these days. But um, I also think in my other internet time-wasting experiences that I also come across so much craft these days where people call themselves craftsmen, especially on you know YouTube and people uh, not only displaying how they make it, like not only displaying their craft, but so focused on the how I make this craft or let me share with you my craft practice and this like um, unveiling of the craftsman's work, which I think is really fascinating, which maybe maybe just what I look up, but I come across it all the time. Um, so I think that's a maybe signs of a revival of the word craft. And thinking about my own practice, how, how I make my own work, I think of craft or craft-like things or craft materials as like another knob that I can turn, like the color red. So if I you know, want to emphasize things being domestic or having to do with children, I might sew something instead of welding it or instead of making it out of foam. So kind of just thinking of it as, a, as like another thing you want, I can modulate to affect the meaning of my work. Uh, yeah, and while we're talking about processes, and Kelly brought up technology and how uh, people may use craft as an escape from technology, we've also seen te technology influence the the way that we craft things. Uh, you know, be it you know, machines or CNC or or what have you. And I wonder, through all of your practices, how. Uh, in, in other ways than, than what you just mentioned, people escaping technology with traditional crafts, how technology has influenced uh, the future of crafts or, or how we create or think about what craft is today. Well, I, um, I think that in a lot of ways, the digital revolution has sort of taken people away from making things. Um, growing up, uh, the most popular magazines when I was growing up highest circulation magazines were popular science and popular mechanics, where there was how-to things in the magazines every month. Every you know, father or mother had a workshop of some sort in the garage, in the basement. Uh, they made shelving. Uh, you know, now it's all replaced by Ikea, that kind of thing. Um, but I 
guess the point is that digital has taken, has taken I mean, this, this is the dexterity nowadays, but my experience is when the students who have not had any experience making something, start making something, something new happens. They're a little afraid of it initially, but something new happens. And I think all of us have experienced making something and then making it again, or, or, or you know, the sort of craft has this tendency to keep pushing you further and further in, into more and more. And I think it's in, the digital tools coming up are being pushed the same way. I think there's, there's a craft, obviously, in, in anything you do. Um, but I think that the, the, in terms of future, there's never gonna, it's never going to go away. The tactile experience is so wired into our brains, I think, that it'll, it's just, it'll just never go away. It'll, there'll always be somebody out there fiddling and diddling, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, I can speak to my work currently right now. I feel like I'm on the cusp of sort of fully embracing technology in my work. I've always made things by hand and carving bones and doing making flowers out of bones and things like that. And um, I've been experimenting with laser cutter because I love that. I used to love to draw when I was an artist and not a craftsperson with my metals degree. Um, I love to draw, and so I wanted to find a way to get my drawings back into my jewelry work, and I discovered the laser could etch, so for example, the laser etched little drawings of birds on this turquoise, so I can take a traditional craft cabochon and set it in silver, but I can add that addition of my drawing onto the work. Um, for me, I cannot sit at a computer and learn Illustrator in the way that some people are so, so natural at, that I have to take it for a picture from my sketchbook, scan it into the computer, do the best I can, and muddle through to get the result I need. So by no means am I strong in my craft at Illustrator or anything on the computer, but I can get by to get what I need, which is my drawings to be etched into the surface of stones or mother of pearl, and then I rub my ink in it. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how I can make them work together, um, although technology is still sort of, you know, it's an overwhelming, it's an overwhelming thing, and I think a lot of people are interested and don't know where to start with movie technology into your work. The 3D printers is often things that people are talking about, and combining that with casting, because the plastic works very well with that process. So we're seeing a lot of things starting to trickle in in our field in jewelry. Um, it's kind of exciting to see where that's all going to go and what people call themselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so unfortunately, I'm not that skilled in the, some of the digital ways that people make art, like uh, CNC or laser cutters or 3D printing. I just don't have very much experience with that, so I can't speak to that all that much, except for Illustrator, which I use occasionally. Um, but I think that the you know online media and um, YouTube and having so much access to watching people craft things and make things has kind of, in a lot of ways, made it very accessible. And I you know I see like even you know I teach elementary school, so every day like you know kids come in and they see. And say, hey, Mr. B, like I learned how to draw this on YouTube. I watched this guy do this on YouTube, which showed me how to do this. So, in some ways, it's I kind of think that's a promising advancement for craft and art in general, having it be like so ubiquitous in that way. Um, so maybe we can shift focuses to another word, um, thinking about design a little bit and how design has made its home in the three D fine arts world. Um, and I wonder what it means to design for a gallery setting rather than for the masses. Well, I've, I've lived in both mm -hmm. areas, um, and uh, I never thought of taking my exhibit work and putting it in a gallery uh, or my mural work or any of that. That's, uh, it's, um, it's always been separate in my head, I, uh, although the separation for me is, is uh, not in, in, in terms of art and design, it's just, uh, actually I don't see separations, I try to meld things, I try to, you know, whatever area I've been working in, uh, I learned a new set of uh, materials and methods to manipulate those materials, and, I just, and then when I get interested in another area, I try to bring those materials and methods into the other area, and so that um, that's always been my interest to meld all of those kinds of things. Um, uh, design to me, uh, I mean, 
this is obviously we have Massachusetts College of Art and Design. It's not Massachusetts College of Art Design or Design Art. It's you know they're separate fields. Um, my students, I always ask my students, what's the difference? And you know, well, they sit there with blank looks on their faces. Nobody, they haven't really considered what's going on. And to my mind, it, it, the difference is that uh, design almost always involves two entities, a client and a designer. Not to say that some designers aren't their own clients, but art uh, is almost, a, it, art tends to be a singular exercise as opposed to involving a second entity, although the commission situation is very similar to the design effort. So um, for me, they're, they are separate entities. They always have been, um, but I'd love to cross over the two. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, a uh, couple of thoughts going around. Um, what I think of when I speak to jewelry, jewelry designers, I don't identify as a jewelry designer. I have a lot of friends who do identify as that. That's how they title themselves. That's how they view their work and what their intent is in the studio. Um, I, my, my perception of a designer in the art field is someone who's making work to, to sell, to have designs that appeal to a certain demographic that they're looking to sell to, um, and to make multiples of those. And, that's great. I mean, it's great that that can fund your studio, fund your life, hopefully. Um, I think in some ways everyone comes up with designs to make something that's a one-off. I don't think of designs, I don't think of designs necessarily living in a gallery space. I think they live in another type of space. Um, that was part of your question, correct? Mm -hmm. like, yeah, design in the gallery. I don't see those very nice, in my opinion, and at least in my small jewelry art field. Um, but yeah, I think um, I, I don't I don't feel very qualified to speak about design sometimes. I I have my perception of it in my field, and I think it's a hustle. I think it's hard work to be a designer. So I think the there's a good parallel between the conceptions or misconceptions of art versus craft, and then art versus design. And there's a certain um, maybe assumption of functionality for design that or that's you know communicating a message with a particular person of purpose like uh, you know we're designing an image to you know advocate for a certain brand or a person or something while art is maybe communicating a message that is more open to interpretation and just like a craft might be assumed to have a to require functionality like a vessel to hold fluid or a vehicle to transport you while art might be more of an object for its own sake. But I think that all of these are you know, interesting parallels, but they could also be broken down. Um, so if, uh, I wonder why everyone thinks about the role of 3D fine art, and this can also include craft and, and design in 2019, um, and also what role these things will play moving forward. Um, particularly, I'm interested in how we can use craft, art, and design uh, to move culture culture forward. Uh, my daughter just gave me a book, a um, uh, really fascinating book. I think um, at the time I'm thinking about this whole uh, discussion. It's, it, um, it's Can Art uh, Aid in Conflict Resolution? Uh, it's a pretty interesting book. Uh, um, uh, and there's maybe 40 or 50 artists, designers, uh, architects uh, that talk about this issue. And um, God, wh why not? Why couldn't conflict resolution become an art form? I mean, <laughs> uh, why couldn't, in this day and age, the presidency become an art form? Right? <laughs> um, I mean, it's. Going forward, I mean, I think the human impulse is to create, fundamentally. I mean, it, it, it's problem solving. I mean, life is problem solving. It's one of the things I tell my students a lot. It's like, you know, you've been making design decisions since you first push yourself up in the, in the, in the crib. And when you first change your position with yourself, from, uh, in, you change your own position with respect to the rest of the world, you're making a design decision. And um, if if we could educate from the beginning that 
life is an art form, I think. I think hockey is like better off. I think going forward, the future of art, craft, and design, I think it's really interesting because I think to some degree it doesn't really matter um, where they're all going and what you define yourself as or what a school calls itself or drops off their name or anything like that. I think it's really important as a singular artist or person or craftsperson to really know where you fall within the history of the timeline going forward. I think you should be able to define what you do um, and be sure about that. But I also believe it's important that you can shift that perception. You can change what you think you are doing. Um, you can also change how you title and define yourself and what your work is. Um, but I think it's really important to understand the history of where you fall in the continuum because they're going to be doing craft and art far, far into the future. Where are you landing in that continuum of spectrum of those three words and the combination of them? Um, so I think it's really important for each artist to kind of really figure out where you land and how you can speak to it. Um, so I think that's important for the future. So my greatest art hero, one of my greatest art heroes, Jonathan Meese, um, the German painter, sculptor, he calls for the future to become a dictatorship of art, <laughs> where art rules the world. And I can't disagree. Mm -hmm. um, and Perhaps my hope for the future of art, design, and craft is that the definitions and the boundaries and the criteria become looser and looser and looser so that the most people can find themselves involved in succeeding in those things. So like if the presidency becomes art and we can all be art presidents, that would be amazing. <laughs> and um, if a lot, if so many people can, you know, feel like they can make art and do it successfully without self-consciousness, without feeling like they're inadequate or that their art isn't good enough or up to par or without thinking that, you know, my knitting isn't isn't fine enough to be, you know, to be craft or to be successful or to be valuable. Um, I feel like that's that would, that would be a beautiful future. So uh, so before we open it up for questions for the audience, I know beforehand I uh, had mentioned to you three that maybe come up with some questions for each other. You all have very different practices. So uh, I'm, I'm curious if any of you have uh, any questions for your other members of the panel before we open it up to the room. I do. Um, I said earlier that I where I fall in the three words. No, because where you guys define yourself in those, those where you fall and how you define yourself. What three words? Our craft. And you say you're a maker of everything, but maker is right. a very also controversial world word. So, mm -hmm. where do you? Well, o over the years, I've, I've called myself a, a, a designer, an artist, a craftsman. Uh, all of those to a at different part to parts of my life, and um, I, I think I'm still all of those things. I don't think there's. Uh, like I said before, there's art and craft and craft and art, or there's art and design and design and art. Um, um, I, I, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would call myself an artist, but maybe that's because I haven't really considered the question very much. <laughs> um, but if I had a microphone, may I ask the next question? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So I'm really interested in Kelly and um, how <coughs> you kind of separate the wear your wearable jewelry from, from not wearable jewelry. <laughs> and in the case of not wearable jewelry, what do you think the jewelry-esque form of that art communicates about that artwork? Good question, thank you. Okay. Um, what is not wearable jewelry? Well, technically you could put them over your head and put them on and wear them. So they are wearable. However, you wouldn't choose to wear them most likely unless it was for like a gallery opening or something and you wanted to look really wild. Um, I see those pieces as, I really actually, as a background in painting, I see them as paintings in some sort of way. Um, I build them as if I'm a painter. I think about my narrative and my arrangement as a collage artist. I play and play with things around. I don't think very much in 3D, personally. I think very flat and 2D. Um, I think those pieces are all about the idea you could wear them and how that makes a viewer feel when they look at it. Mm -hmm. um, the wearability 
it's I distill parts of it that I think the public can consume and be okay with, and because I think sometimes my work does um, unsettle people that some the people who are unsure about what the intent behind my work is. Um, so the wearability is a way to sort of soothe people and sort of enter them into the conversation or the dialogue about this, this is jewelry. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I see it was like wall paintings These are wall yeah. necklaces, really. So, so is, is implying the the head in in like because I see a lot of the work is, is a necklace on the wall. Yeah. So is the neck like a spoke like a is it like a shadow neck implied in that in, in our viewing? Am I to imagine? Good question. No. No. <laughs> no. I do not want a head and a neck in there. <laughs> um, I really see them in the circular in the <laughs> circle of life. I sort of see them as a metaphor for our existence. Um, so if I think if they were shown on a like even a fake neck and head on the wall, I would be very averse to that. So um, that's an interesting question. I never really thought about that, but I knew strongly what my answer was. Um, yeah, I see them as more of a painting in a circle of continuum of life. All right, anything else before we open it up? Um, so I have a question for you, Peter. Mm -hmm. um, I was really interested in, in especially how you, you know, you've talked about your work so far and looking at your work and how have so many different um, different ways of working between your drawings and your, your your wooden pieces, and how you feel like the different method of crafting affects how your mind works creatively. I don't think so. Um, I don't. Again, I don't see them as all that separate anymore. Um, I I have uh, a pretty wide range of interests, and I you know kind of skip along between them. Uh, one of my favorite painters is um, Wayne Tebow, no, no relation, mm -hmm. but uh, he does portraits, then he does landscapes, and then he does objects, and then he does portraits or figures, and then he does landscapes, and he does portraits, and he's bouncing mm -hmm. back and forth. And I think if you asked him what he liked best, that he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't have this thing. I mean, not that I'm trying to equate myself with him, but um, I don't know, it's just, I just react, I, 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 I react to what I see, and if something flashes in my head, I pursue it, and if it doesn't fit my picture, I put it away and mm -hmm. move on to something else. Uh, the com uh, the, some of the major furniture work, um, I don't do much anymore because uh, the galleries don't sell, I got a house full of it. Um, <laughs> And um, so, uh, you know, to spend 50 or 60, 100 hours on a piece of furniture doesn't make any sense unless it's a commission. And at this point in my life, even commissions are, are difficult. Uh, you know, my brain pushes my body harder than my body wants to do at, at this point. So, um, I don't know, it's, it's I, I just, my life is just looking at things and reacting to things. I, a long time ago, I learned to turn what I am interested in into my work. Um, like I was a flea market freak, and so a lot of furniture is made out of found objects. And so that's what I that's what I call something. Um, so I I would love to get the audience involved a little bit if there is interest. I wonder if anyone here has any questions for our panelists. Yes. Um, it was for Kelly specifically. Um, I'm also like a jewelry metalsmith major at Mass Art here, and I was just wondering, um, you said it's very important to define yourself in that specific time in history and where you fall along that line. And I was just wondering um, what are kind of like tools and kind of helpful ways that you use to define yourself within that spectrum? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, there's a book that we were forced to read, and it probably was over 600 pages, and every week we met it. It's called Makers, and it was the first book by Bruce Metcalf, and oh, sorry, I'm blanking on the other, the other co-author, uh, Karen Caldwell. Yeah, that sounds right, I know it was a female. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, we had to read this book, and we had to learn about every single detail from when craft began, and that was so helpful <laughs> for me to really understand, like, oh, this isn't just new and I'm not just like discovering this, like there have been female metalsmiths who've been forging their way all along um, in this field that, you know, is now made by a lot of male jewelers and 
metal smiths and the same for ceramics. So it, even though I don't identify with ceramics, I'm, I'm part of their family. Um, so I think that book was really helpful for me personally. That comes to mind. Um, and just a lot of reading, a lot of articles. I'm happy to share some with you because I see it in the studio. Um, but yeah, just reading is sort of informing yourself and seeing like who do you, who do you connect with in the way that they make. Maybe not their narrative, but um, find what speaks to you and then sort of use that as your jumping point for defining it. Mm. And like I said, it's okay if it's continually changing. So you can change your mind every day if you want. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Um, so I know a couple of you seem to have mentioned this idea of history informing craft and that there there is to some extent historical president pre precedence for that. Um, so I know like Kelly, you were mentioning the idea of a form of a necklace and we can recognize that form and therefore sort of draw more conclusions for what you're talking about sewing is going to imply something different from welding and that history of those forms. So how does or does history and history of craft influence your work? Or how do you play with that idea? I personally, I know history, but I don't feel like I, I mean, I don't create with that in mind on any level. I mean, I, I, I'd love to learn about what's happened, but I, I, I don't believe that, well, obviously with osmosis it, it influences you, but I don't try to play on history. Actually, the only way I do play on history is sarcastically or, um, or uh, parody. I, I recently taken to making assemblages that are based on art art history pieces, um, uh, plays on words, puns, that relate to a particular piece of artwork. That's, that's how I look at history. So I don't, I don't think I look at history very much in terms of art versus craft in my work, but I think a lot about story and um, what the particular way of working implies about either the story of the object I'm making or the story or like the maybe imagined story of the maker and kind of what the way we hobble things together has to say about the hobbler. And think, you know, you know, for example, thinking about like Ed and Nancy Keenholz and how their particular way of putting together their assembly just really spoke, you know, created a narrative about what kind of world those things are coming from. That's that's my question. I like that question a lot. I'm gonna be thinking about that for a while. Um, I think a lot about the history of our materials, especially. Um, I, I, I look often to my work to the Victorians and um, their use of hair, um, their use of mother pearl and like lover's eyes and painting on top of that, and I use mother pearl in my work. So even the material choices you're making are telling the viewer something, if the viewer is in tune to what you're maybe trying to tell them. Um, even just working in gold or silver, the, his, the history or the contemporary practice of acquiring those materials um, all mean something in our field. So I think not only just history and like who's done what in the past, it's the, the history of the materials you're choosing are um, something to really research and know about and you should be able to speak to. Um, that's why I also think the technology element of your questions were really interesting because now there's all these new materials that are popping in and do they have history or do they have history? So um, that's why I think it's interesting the continuum of craft and making. So um, in terms of history, I think a lot of times I find I, I'll get it, um, I'll try something, and I'll find out that there's a history behind it. Um, like, um, I'm always looking for a lot of something cheap. And one day I was at a gas station asking for directions, and they were selling bags of coal. And it was like $5 for this bag of coal. So I, I bought it. With, uh, and then I. I found out that you can carve coal and you can shape coal. Um, this is the particular type that I that I found, and I started making small sculpture with um, coal and wax, and then I found out about jet jewelry. Do you know about jet jewelry? Mm -hmm. um, and jewelry. right, um, and there was there's a whole historical thing uh, about carving coal like a jewel and wearing it for funerary situations. Um, so history sort of always comes back to bite you somehow, yeah. right? Um, and, 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 and well, not just bite you, educate you, right? I mean, so that's 
So that's how history works for me. Yeah. yeah, it informs what you're going to do next, I think, also, too. It's, it's yeah, more perfect. Yeah, it can lead you new paths. Lead you right? new paths. Right. Like, when I first started working with the dead birds, I thought, like, man, no one's worked with dead birds before. And then you do a little looking, <laughs> and I found out in the coal mine they would have canaries down there. And there was one beloved pet canary, and somebody made a little coffin. And I was like, look, someone in history was just as weird as me, <laughs> deciding they needed a funeral for a dead bird. Um, so it's, it is interesting to do that research. Yeah. No. Just as long as you have a refrigerator. <laughs> Freezer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so obviously a question for everybody. Um, I'm, I've been thinking a lot about need-based making and how that relates to um, each of your very different practices or doesn't perhaps. Um, I'm thinking about how need-based making has changed very much over time. Uh, in place, of course, in culture. Um, but I think many of us in this room, based on the fact that we're here in this area, in this climate, um, many of us probably make things, but we are probably in and around the culture where you don't need to make much unless it's an internal drive. So I'm curious how you all see um, need-based making in, say, our quote-unquote contemporary US, say, East Coast, uh, environment and how, if at all, do you think that influences maybe what's what's popular and what people as audiences are familiar with and how they might interpret what you're making? Okay. Now that's kind of a layered question, but feel free to do whatever. Can I ask how you define these based making? Well, I was I was thinking back to what um, what uh, Peter said about how um, many people in the past in the U.S. have had. Um, workshops in their homes. So like making was a mode of everyday life, um, not just like uh, a human urge, but a human necessity. Um, and now at least what I see is that it's, there, there's less of that in a like kind of bare bones survival way, um, at least where I come from and what I come from. Um, so I'm, I'm curious like where you see making in everyday life for say non-artists, non-craftspeople, non-designers, and how do you think that might influence these realms? Interesting. Um, certainly jewelry is not a need. Um, however, in all histories and all cultures, people have adorned their bodies for yeah. certain reasons and for it to be decorative, you know, taking shells and stringing those or finding a way to paint their bodies with the flowers in their hair, things like that. Um, I, I'm thinking a lot about need-based making in the form of mental health. I think for me, I need to make so I feel sane. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, every time I step out of the studio, even if it's for a half hour, um, I feel so different and better after. So I can see that being a way of coping with our future world and society is something that people do is a, a mental health, which I think is something the current dialogue we need to shift towards taking care of that as, as well. <laughs> I, I think that in the, the realm of design lives in the need base a lot more than art. I, uh, my wife made a painting many years ago called Too Many Artists. Mm -hmm. and, um, it, it, and there are like too many artists. Mm -hmm. and, and they're all making. Mm -hmm. And I, I, well, I recognize the imperative, the, the internal imperative to make, mm -hmm. uh, you know, making, need based making is completely different than the art world today, mm -hmm. I think. And uh, you know, you the artist may need it, but does mm -hmm. the planet need it as much as the artist does? Mm -hmm. That's a big question. I mean, mm -hmm. that S word, the new S word, sustainability, right? Mm -hmm. um, what, what, where does it all go? I mean, I, I, I'm, I've accumulated an enormous amount of art mm -hmm. in my life, and uh, in my work, other people's work, and materials to make art. I'm at a point where I'm saying, <laughs> how do I deal with it? And my kids are reminding me, like, I'm not dealing with it, you're going to deal with it. <laughs> so, you know, I think uh, too much artwork is, is not need based, unfortunately. So I'll, I'll answer the question with a personal anecdote. And um, so I, you know, I used to do youth whitewater canoeing and kayaking trips. And through that job, Part of it was that we would have all the kids make portions of their own equipment as need-based making. So um, one project that we did with them was we molded 
composite helmets, so helmets made from fiberglass and Kevlar. Don't judge me for the safety aspect. <laughs> and the paddle and homemade helmets. But that really opened my own personal mind to using composite materials, and that really influenced my own work, where now I like to cover produce boxes in fiberglass. So <laughs> like that, that need, a little bit of need-based work, or imagined need-based work, mm -hmm. kind of informed my non-need-based practice. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I'll also switch to switch <laughs> modes and, and speak to this one. Um, you know, I think a functional objects take on a much different meaning when you're no longer making them out of necessity. And I think with just how cheap stuff is and how much is available today, even when I think about like, I'm a furniture maker and there's some things where I know it would be cheaper material and time-wise to just buy something at Ikea for my own home if I have to. And you know, my, my roommate's an elementary school teacher and she was like, oh, we all need new shelves for our classrooms and what would it cost for you to make it? And it's like, for the sheet of plywood, you could, just the materials, like you could purchase a finished shelf at a store. So um, I, I don't see a lot of need-based making other than uh, you know, to, to Kelly's point, maybe it, it feeds the soul or whatever, but functional objects today, I feel like fill a, a cultural narrative and in history you learn so much about a civilization based on the objects that uh, they make. And in, in the past, the objects they've made for, for need and those artifacts are, are so fascinating. And it is interesting that today we still continue to make functional objects. and. I think we're a little more self-aware these days that what we're creating isn't just a platter for someone or a chair for someone, but it is a, a narrative piece. And we're thinking, hopefully, as we make these pieces, which sometimes it feels ridiculous to do so because of, we live in so much abundance, uh, but hopefully, as makers, we're, we're conscious of what it really means to be placing these objects uh, in, into the world. Yes. Um, I've been thinking about um, the, the design versus the designer versus maker versus artist and where, where one fits and um, that uh, what I think about is aren't we supposed to not fit? Um, I mean, there's a, there's a way in which um, it seems like um, all of that covers looking at things in a way that, in a different way than fitting. Um, so I guess, uh, um, I'm not sure what the, how, what the question is, but um, I guess maybe if people have any comment about not fitting and not hi the hierarchy too, um, really, uh, there's something about that that bothers me, sort of like uh, devaluing a person for what they do. Um, doesn't compare, you know, artist compared to uh, designer, compared to maker, compared to craft person. Um, do you have an answer? Uh, no, I'm just, I have a question. I have a point of artists, craftsmen, and designers. Um, actually, uh, I came in from art school, but I became a designer. Now I'm going back to my art. But uh, I see in everything that I do as an object or a piece, it, I have to create, I have to design, I have to craft it. And if it's pretty, I hang up. <laughs> so now if it's please someone to see it, maybe not even use it, just to look at it, but that's a use. That is making a purpose. Right. So I think Why we have museums, right? Exactly. <laughs> so I think the, the technology here is also creating art, design, craft, and so forth. It's all something that was created. It can be even the science. I just want to say medicine is an art. Not even, you know, they make mistakes, they make beautiful things, cosmetics, but, uh, so, but it's still an art. So you can see that somebody's creating something. I think the word, we are creators. Some people create lousy stuff. Well, you don't have to look at it. Some people create gorgeous stuff, 
beautiful, you can afford it. So my point, my intention now is to create things that people cannot do. Because I wish people, more people would have pleasant things in their home. I'm not going to say the word pretty thing, but something that gives them pleasure looking at. So I think uh, all that what we do as an artist, we create stuff. And I'll stop because I don't want to let the answer stop. It's the general part. So I was wondering what you guys think about what I'm saying. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I get to ask my students all the time, you know, they, they, what's the difference between art and design? And they say, well, art doesn't really have a function. I said, well, of course it has a function, huh. right? It's like museums all over the world, right? I mean, like, you know, of course it's a function. Uh, it, not, it is not necessarily a workable function, per se, but there's an emotional content, of uh, physicality, uh, you know, oh, yeah. Lot, lots of issues come up, uh, you know, it speaks to our, our, I guess it speaks to our desires as a species, basically, to move forward, to recognize something new. And anytime, I mean, you talk about something that doesn't fit, you know, I mean, that's how art movements start, right? People are tired of what they're seeing. And somebody tries something else, provokes, pokes the, pokes the bear, right? And something else happens. And a couple more people recognize it and get on it. And uh, I mean, but the world changes, with the information, the world changes so much now. I mean, the abstract expressionists and the Cedar Bar it's just not going to happen anymore. It's not going to happen. If you try to make it happen, it's not going to happen. That's one of the bad things about history, about understanding history. Trying to recreate history, you can't do it. You have to do what you do and make new history as far as I'm concerned. Right? Does that answer that question? I don't know. You know, I'd like to add about, uh, we talked briefly about the technology and especially the digital world where I use quite a bit, because I use uh, my graphic design business, but so I was kind of, you know, introduced and love it. And I'm able to, let's say, create much more without having to have a warehouse to carry it. I carry it in a hard drive. <laughs> <laughs> so that, my wife loves that. Right. You know, uh, but again, so because I can create something, some work that takes me 20 hours, 40 hours, but I can, with my clients, I can offer them output from my artwork in seven mediums, seven sizes, depending on like the commission. I do sell in on canvas, on wood, or in glass, or whatever they choose. And I think people, I mean, criticize me as being like a really commercial about it. <laughs> Are we all commercial? I mean, I don't know. I, I couldn't understand if I'm trying to make a living, why I'm not commercial. We all try to sell a whole, right? What do you think of uh, the digital world? Question? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, um, I know when I'm, when I'm teaching, I sometimes like to bring up the artist Don Delbois and a particular mm -hmm. um, artwork he made, a um, series of artwork he made, where it's a tattooed pig. And I show a slide, and it's a slides of tattooed pigs, taxidermy pigs, pig skins, all tattooed all referencing, you know, design or illustration on the tattoos and the history of that. And I start asking my students, well, is this art? And what do you guys think about this? And I get, you know, various answers. A lot of people are disappointed for pigs. And then I show a video of Ville Belvoir speaking about the piece. And what he says is that, you know, the, uh, I, I went to China, I bought a pig farm, I hired tattoo artists to move to this pig farm, to live on this farm, tattoo these pigs, feed these pigs, care for these pigs. And to me, that's the art. The, like, the, the act of doing this was the art, and the pigs are just an afterthought to in, entertain the masses in, in, a, in a way. But he had to go to China because it wouldn't let him build. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and then, you know, thinking about that, it's like, does that fit? I'm not sure if it fits. Maybe he has different opinions of where that fits in the whole scheme of art, design, and craft. Or it's just like, ridiculousness, but it makes me have to think about it. And he's the same man who made a machine that creates shit. Yeah. Right? You put all the things you eat into this machine, and it becomes a machine, which he vacuum packs and sells as art. Yeah. 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 He's not fitting in the box. Huh? He's not fitting in the box. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, he's a sort of sure. Yeah. <laughs> and he, uh, he has also has a friend um, who has tap, uh, his back tattooed, and he has willed his skin when he <laughs> dies, and an ox, a, 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 a patron has bought the rights to his back. So when he dies, they're going to strip the skin off his back, and this guy's going to own it. Wow. Well, <laughs> we are. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want to ask a follow-up. So, so the intent, I want to ask a question of the panel for the stories you're telling. Does the narrative matter? You say the narrative matters, the story matters, but only if you know the story. And so one of the beautiful things about art is that you can, you can just experience it directly without the narrative, without the label, without the price. So I, I think... As I'm a designer, you can tell, um, I think, anyway. So I think for me, it always matters how accessible something is in order to draw someone into a narrative. If you assume the narrative for me, you assume too much. And if you experience something that is difficult, you may not have reached someone in what I think is a respectful way. So I'm an architect. So I always work for somebody else, that's me. Um, and so I'm always <coughs> worried about that other person. But for me, it's always interesting, this design and art discussion, because the artist assumes you'll deal with it, because that's the idea. So you have to know the narrative. But if you don't, you may have lost someone. Or you may get something new. Yeah, right. that's the risk. Right, so I mean, there's, so there's, there's, both, there's both happening in a museum, right? You go. Right. With, with you know, there's some pieces that have like acres of wall text, right? And wall text is becoming an art in and of itself, right? So they're they're giving you the narrative, they're trying to influence how you think about yeah. it, as opposed to a lot of other things that are just there. And there are other art, there are artists like Josh, Jasper Johns who refuses to talk about his work. He refuses to articulate about what his work is about. He loves to sit there and watch other people speculate. And he smiles, and he you know, you know, a big an enigmatic smile. And, but so I think this that art is both, art and design. Well, design can't be both. No, you know, design's got to have an yeah. art on some level, right? It's got to it's got to talk to the usefulness on some level. I mean, there are many artists like Robert Harriet who does out of scale furniture, you know, like a table and chair that you can literally walk under. The scale has changed, right? Um, and this guy named Roy McMacken, who's yeah. uh, who has a full-blown wood shop. He, he makes his living as a furniture designer, but he also shows up Matthew Marks in New York, right? Um, and then there's Richard Prince, who's like another art provocateur, who owns an auto body shop in upstate New York, and sometimes has shown automobile hoods encased in a block of Bondo with no finish shining them, you know? Tony Craig periodically makes sculpture where he leaves the bondo and the, and the you know, unfinished surfaces. So, I don't know, you know, it goes both ways, I think, right? All right, so I think we're uh, at, at the end here, but uh, if anyone has remaining questions at the end, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll be around for a few minutes more. Um, should I turn it back over to you? That's all, okay. Um, so, what's the next month's film? Think yeah. Thursdays? Yeah. You can join us again next month for uh, Think Thursdays on uh, film and photo. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. Thank you.